Welcome to Living Word Worship Center Wednesday night Bible study. God bless you. Thank you for coming. All of you here, all of you out there on Facebook, God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Amen. Amen. Uh, we're going to begin uh, Wednesday night as we usually do with our opening prayers. And I'll just uh, read from the list of prayer requests we have here and then We'll all pray together if you'd be so kind as to agree. Uh, for B.J. Davenport, for Jim Roebuck, also uh, George Roebuck, let me throw him in there. Uh, Shelby Long, William Drugalis, Mark Cox, Robin Schwalick, Mary Walker, David Heron, um, Robert Kirby Jr., for Mason, Nick, April, for Kane, for Michael Knott, for Sean, Mary, Mark Tardiff, Brandon P., Tracy Walters Begley, uh, Felicia Begley, Jamie Rowe and family, Anthony, Bethany, Carey, Gino, Spider, Lee Calusa, Don Lee, Rich Clifford, Jeff, Jeff Ryder, Reader, I'm sorry, Jeff Reader's dad, uh, passed away, so we, Jeff asked we remember him, his mom especially, uh, his, his dad passed away. God bless you, Jeff. <coughs> Thanks for asking. And for Gary uh, Markline, for Remy, Mona, Chris T, Lil C, uh, Sean, Mary, Chris, also uh, for Lorian and uh, Dave, um, lost their pet, Today, kind of reinforce them with a little prayer here this evening. That's pretty tough duty for a while there. God bless you. We love you and thank you and sorry for that. Um, so are we good in the room then? Okay, so I'd like to ask all of us to agree together and all of you who are watching on uh, Facebook, if you just agree together with us in prayer for these people. Our Father in heaven, we're so thankful for this opportunity once again to meet together and come into your presence, acknowledging that your word is true and faithful, eternal, and is the final word. And it is your word that we pray tonight. We pray the word that you've given us. We pray that you would minister in the way that you have promised, in the way that you have prepared, that you would heal those who are afflicted, comfort those who are in mourning, and strengthen those who are weakened. We ask that you would encourage all of us, inspire us, speak to our hearts, and cause us to learn and to grow and to receive from the things of the Spirit. Cause us to see farther, wider, deeper, and beyond what we have ever known up to this moment. Redeem this time to the utmost we possibly can. For your name's sake and for your glory, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you and thank you so much for coming. At this time, I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Dave Heron if he'll come and minister the word to us for a few minutes. And uh, God bless you all and God bless you, Dave, as you come. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. It is a good evening. Today's a good day to be alive especially if you're facing the alternative, today's a good day to be alive. Um, I'd like to talk tonight uh, out of Luke 23 and 2 Corinthians 12, hope for sinners. And I, I am bold enough to say that applies to everybody in the room. And uh, as always, Pastor Larry, thank you so much for this privilege. Let's start together in Luke 23, beginning with verse 32. This is concerning Jesus being nailed to the cross and the events surrounding that. Two other men, both criminals, were also out with him to be executed. When they came to a place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right 
the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. And the soldiers divided up his clothes, casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They had offered him wine vinegar and said, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was written a notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Talk about two completely different worlds colliding between the arrogant criminal and the repentant criminal. I have been both. I I don't come to you as a man who has arrived, although I've sure gained some stability over the years. I still consider myself a learner. In fact, I've learned that the term disciple is one of honor because it means that you're open-minded and you're ready to learn. I pray that I would always be that kind of man and I pray that all of us would be that kind of people, open-minded, ready to learn. Then 2 Corinthians 12, Paul's thorn in the flesh. He says this, I must go on boasting. Although there is nothing to be gained, I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain so that no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I must confess to you this evening, I have a weakness in this way. I have a hard time with weaknesses of receiving insults. I don't like hardships. I hate persecutions and difficulties I'm no fan of. What? It's a big club. 
I, I sense I'm not alone in that. So I, I can say we from now on, and nobody will be offended. We are frail people. Now we are not frail in our spirit, but we are frail in our flesh. And our flesh reminds us of that. We are not frail in our spirit, but we are frail in our soul. And our soul reminds us of that. We are a triad being, body, soul, and spirit. I'm just so glad that my spirit is tied in together, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, with Jesus the Master by the power of the Holy Spirit given to live inside, so that I am not a man without hope. Love hopes all things, believes all things, etc. Without hope, there's really no direct guidance from God. Because God lives in hope. I, somebody taught me one time years ago, said, uh, he, do, he said, don't ever say to God, oh, you're not going to believe what I just did. <laughs> I didn't <even> know. <laughs> yes. <laughs> God, you're not going to believe what I just did. He said, because God knew what you did before you even thought to do it. And he was faithful and merciful to you while you were doing it. And his heart is open to your sorrow. He receives your repentance. And he treats you as if you never did it. Boy, I can worship a God like that. Can you? Oh, boy, I'm just get all wound up on here. So. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, as a, as a psychotherapist, I understand the value of body, soul, and spirit. They each have a function. And if one is lacking, the others are thrown off. There's a triunity in how God made us that only when all three parts of ourself are functioning in harmony do we prosper, do we flow, do we emanate the very will of God. I had no idea what I was missing before I knew Jesus. I knew how to take care of myself. Harold and I were talking earlier, swapping stories about being mean when we were younger. Not, not that you ever know that about him, but, <laughs> but I, I come up and tell you about mine, so. It, it just, uh, it, it's just an amazing thing what God can do with carnality when you recognize that the blood of Jesus is not diluted regardless of what you've done, regardless of who you've done it to. In the 12-step work that I'm devoted to in my own recovery, we learned that forgiveness is secured through making amends. Making amends means to be nitpicky with yourself and merciful towards somebody else. Being nitpicky with yourself and merciful to somebody else. A buddy of mine in Ohio, we used to say to each other, the only one, the only thing that you and I are going to argue about today is who is more merciful. Well, I'd never heard that growing up. People used to run from me. Get out of that guy's way. You don't want to be the, in the line next to him. You're either going to get tripped or your books are going to be on the floor. Or some type of calamity is going to happen to you on the way to class. Give him a wide berth. 
<laughs> well, I'm here to tell you, Jesus Christ gives us a wide berth. It is his will that none would perish. It says so somewhere in this book. It's his will that none would perish. He will go out of his way to find a way to make the most little itty bitty covenant. Because there are very few humans that at their worst do not cry out for some kind of higher power. Now there are a few arrogant ones. I was one of them. The more calamity I was in, the more determined I was to to land on my feet. And Jesus made room for me. And I never get tired of telling about it. I hope you don't get tired of me telling you about it. Is it, you know, confess your faults to one another. And I'd like to keep a very short list of my faults. And the way I do that, the way I prevent myself from keeping secrets, is I tell on myself quickly. It doesn't mean I'm any less spiritual or devoted or biblical or anything else. I'm just afraid of the consequences. I admit to you, I fear the consequences. And I want to make sure that there is nothing that my father would ever have to suffer from me because I thought I had a better idea. In Luke 23, talking about these criminals, they both were guilty of the same thing, charged with the same thing, (coughs) convicted of the same thing, and were on public display for the same thing that over the hours, it became more and more painful to pull themselves up so they could breathe. And when they did, their feet and their arms screamed. I don't know if you've ever had this happen to you, but I had a nail gun go through my hand one time when I was younger. I had a heck of a time getting that out. I'm looking. I can, I can see the end of it, and over here there's this long nail. And, and the first thing I knew to do was to grab and grab and grab. And all I did was make myself more, snow, more sore until my coworker, my boss, came up and went like this, and the nail came out. Pain caused me to panic, and my thinking just went goofy. Thank God I wasn't by myself that day. And brothers and sisters, that's why we are called to walk beside one another. So that when one is weak, the other is strong. Read that here. So when one is being foolish, the other one can bring about a balance and you know, keep the guy out of trouble. When one is hungry, the other one can feed. When one is thirsty, the other one can give a cup of cold water in the name of the Lord. We are not designed to be a lone entity. We are designed to be family. We are designed to be comrades. We are designed that our hearts would compartmentalize within each other, not against each other. And I'd like to say that that attribute is one that the church can emulate if we dare. It's not that we are better than other people, it's that I hope that we have the good sense to get, our, uh, get down on our knees before we hit the street. Don't be lured by hell to be out there into soul winning before you've done your own business on your face with God. Another thing I learned the hard way. Oh, I've got the spirit in me and off I'd go. I'd come back later on the day just morally beat to a pulp by somebody who knew more 
or somebody who was more resistant. And it was, it was all a very fleshly effort on my part. I read somewhere in here that says, be still and know that I am God. Be still, that doesn't just mean be quiet. To be still and know that I am God means to be quiet internally. To, to have the good sense to do some kind of spiritual and moral inventory first thing in the morning, not later in the day when you've got messes to clean up because you forgot. Because Lucifer will see to it that the messes are waiting. He'll even, he'll even push them out into the hallway so you trip over them. We're not called to jump over top of those things. We're called to clean them up. Starting with the inside out. And I'm telling you why that's so important. It is frustrating to clean up messes by other people when you haven't cleaned your own self up first. Mm -hmm. Hard to do it. It's easy to be judgmental of somebody and saying, well, if I would have. Meanwhile, you, you look back an hour and you've been the one stepping over your own stuff. Just because nobody saw it, it's as if it didn't happen. Just in time for the enemy to show up and say, uh-huh. Welcome to my world. And we sometimes walk away with our tail between our legs saying, Lord, give me a reset, please. Sometimes he says yes, sometimes he says no. I've not learned a whole lot when he says yes. I usually learn when he says no you're going to have to you're going to have to do some things differently if you want my affection you have my love but if you want my affection see that's a different thing in the godhead they're not all packaged together father son holy spirit three different functions three different variables in every life circumstance And if you leave one out of the configuration, if it doesn't bite you today, it will bite you soon with interest. And that's an embarrassing day because, you know, in your soul of souls, you think, well, I got by on that one. Oh, no, you didn't. Both teams were calculating what it was going to take to get you. God is calculating mercy. Lucifer is calculating um, death and fear and pain. Did I read 2 Corinthians yet? I don't think I did. Did I? I must go on boasting. There's nothing to be gained. Did I read it? Sometimes I get lost in my own <laughs> self. And, you know, that, that used to bother me. You know, when I was young in the ministry and thought I had something to prove. Now, I just ask. <laughs> you know, it, just, it is. It makes the evening go much more smoothly. And everybody else out there that's imperfect says, well, I'm not the only one. Even the man of God has moments. Paul's thorn in the flesh. This, uh, this principle has been misused so frequently it's hard to even put a number on it. Whether Paul deserved the thorn in the flesh or whether he just bumped into it, it broke off the bush and went into his skin is just not my emphasis this evening. The point is, 
He had a thorn. Now that thorn in many ways is figurative. It may have been a character defect. It may have been uh, hidden sin. It may have been uh, a lack of duty in his studies. Could have been trying to polish the wrong reputation. I'm not sure. But what I do know is that thorn was not designed to stay in there permanently. But I will tell you, if you let that stay in there long enough, our body will heal over top of it. And then you've got to dig and do surgery to get it out. So it is with psychological and moral problems. That's why my recommendation tonight is get clean, come clean, walk out clean. Get clean, come clean, walk out clean. Don't come back on Sunday morning with which you should have, because then you're starting in a deficit, and it's hard to catch up with that. Cleanliness does not mean prissiness. It, It really does not. Some of the most spiritually cleanly people I know, quite honestly, smelled. I'm saying, you know, I'd see them and they'd want to come up and hug me and I'd want to give them a wide berth because I knew I was going to have to wash my clothes when I got home. There was one guy in particular, Lori and I know, who was very toxic in this way and yet he had zero insight about his own Mm -hmm. self. He just, we never did quite figure him, what? You loved him anyway. Yes, we sure did. (laughs) I even determined in Jesus I was going to get closer to him, if for no other reason than to give some other people room to smell. (laughs) Ministry comes in many forms. Coming alongside a brother in need means sometimes you get dirty with what he has need of. Discipleship shows you how to stop it at the surface so it doesn't get on the inside. Cause you to question yourself. Cause you to think less of that person. And a root of bitterness gets in there. We see that a lot, don't we? Somebody who's got bitterness. They're almost slumped over when they walk. Sometimes they're overly proud as a way to cover up what they know to be a weakness on the inside and they don't want anybody to know it. Of course, we would never see this in the church. Oh, the pastor, the room got quiet. The room got quiet. Actually, I'm glad we see it in the church because if we have the courage, we can get that corrected in the church so that that person is not a bad witness about our church out of the church. Let us not be the reason why somebody else avoids coming to church But that means we have to do hard internal work first when we're alone or when we're with our spiritual family where we can confess our faults one to another and and, uh, encourage one another as long as the day is the day. That's what I want. That's what I think I have to contribute in, in when I talk is to steer us toward the better way, not to be superior. Steer us toward the better way in order to make us more attractive. I mean, I do something as simple as knowing myself to where I put, you know, something sweet in my mouth before I come into church. 
You know, I, I don't want you saying, well, blah. <laughs> I'd like to tell you about some long-standing orthodox beliefs about heaven. Heaven is, has indescribable light and beauty, 1 Corinthians 2.9. Heaven has great enlargement of knowledge 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Heaven has emotional healing and rest in God's provisions. Number four. Heaven has assigned divine services to render. Revelation 7, 15. Number five. Heaven has full measures of joy. Revelation 21, 4. Number six, heaven has stability, permanence, and perpetual growth. Number seven, heaven has social interactions, Hebrews 12, 22 to 23. And number eight, heaven has interactive fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ taken from a volume called Heaven by Reverend Judson Cornwall. Heaven is not a boring place. Never has been, never will be. Fortunately, there's a gate that we have to go through to get into heaven. Many of us are people that we know would like to just burst through there because we've been so tired of our life. You're on something now. What's that? I say you're on it now. Yeah. Angels, holy angels, guard heaven's gates. Because what goes through that gate had better be pure so as to not spoil the soup on the inside. Heaven has social interactions. Will we know one another? According to Hebrews, yep, get introduced to some people that were in our background that came before us. Prepare for those that are coming so that we can be among the first to welcome them when they arrive. Heaven is a place of perpetual activity is what I'm trying to get at. I don't want heaven to seem intimidating to me when I arrive. And so what I do is I get active now so that it's not a stretch and I don't get worn out too soon when I arrive there. Oh boy, I, I just, I, I, you know, of course, some of you heard about our dog passing today, and so I, I come with uh, very little leeway emotionally, so I'm just kind of getting to it. And I, I know that you care and you'll take that into account. So I'm trusting that I'm not offensive, but uh, you know, the word of God is very matter of fact. Why shouldn't we be? We dance around being matter of fact to others' peril, not our own. We're fine. We're good. 
We're born again. We're in the kingdom. But when we dance around the gospel because we're uncomfortable relating that to somebody else, it's to their peril. Don't be satisfied with having had a handshake and a hello and move on by. Don't be satisfied with that. Linger with the people that you come in contact with. Linger. Ask questions. Not everybody's going to open up right away. Asking questions is a skill. Asking silly questions is not a skill. Prepare before you go out in public. Think through, put yourself in some scenarios about what you might be experiencing during the day. You know, have, have some pretend people sit with you in your room and, and go, go over some things. How will I answer if they say this? How will I, well, if they ask this question, what would I recommend? And, you know, am I, am I just trying to show off? Or can I really give them a guarantee that what I, what I suggest that they do will work for them and it will cause them to prosper? You don't want somebody coming back to you later and saying, why didn't you have the courage to tell me the truth about me? Why did you do that to me? Didn't you know I was reaching out to you? Of course we didn't know. They were just... We are the ones that are called to be perceptive, not them. We are to rise up in who we are in the kingdom of God and, and get spit-shined every morning and be ready for service, however we may find it, so that we are not shocked at what we run into. There was a little boy in our neighborhood growing up. There's always one in every neighborhood. This kid, what, what's the one, the peanuts that's got dirt falling off them all the time? Pig pen. Pig pen. Pig pen. Pig pen, yeah. Why didn't I think of that? This boy was Ping Pen. His, na his name was Ben, and he was Pig Pen. I mean, boy, people would see him coming, and, and they would... You know, and, and he, he, just, he just kept coming. He wanted attention. He was younger than the rest of us. And he thought if he would bull his way into the middle of what we were doing, we would pay attention to him. Well, of course, we were a bunch of unsafe kids and concerned about our own self. And we didn't want to wear his grime home. You know, I ran into him years later. He had done two stints in prison. He'd come to Christ in prison. And when he saw me, well, he was different. I mean, he was grown, he was dressed well, he, he was carrying a case, you know, wearing a tie. And he came up to me and he said, I want to curse you for how you treated me growing up. What you did, what you didn't do. I want to curse you. But you made me grow. I didn't like it then. I'm not sure I even like it now, Ben said. But I sure like how I've turned out. And so in a strangest way, I want to shake your hand and say thank you. Boy, I tell you what, I, I still think about that day. It just I mean, I could feel his hand. It was warm and strong and Look me right in the eye. 
So what I'm saying is, lest we concern, be concerned about perfection, just do what you can. Just know in your heart of hearts that you're on a mission from God, not from yourself. Do your best, and however it turns out, somehow in the cosmos that will benefit that person, even if you walk away and later on thinking, well, I wish I, well, I should have said that, and why didn't I, and that's okay, there'll be somebody else come around, you can practice your amends on them. You see, God doesn't depend on us to do his work. He attends to us as we do his work. It's all about him. Some of us are, who are you know, not as extroverted as others, you can feel, you know, you, you get in a crowd and you find yourself stepping back and letting somebody else get ahead of you just because you're not as comfortable with yourself. According to Luke 23 and 2 Corinthians 12, he has not designed us to exist in the second row. God has designed us to be front and center, here I am, as I am. Song about that, just as I am with one, without one plea. Yeah. For Christ, you know, shed for me his blood. Be front and center, please. For the sake of those people who are waiting on you, for the sake of those people who've had other people pass them on by. For the sake of those people whose whatever confidence they had has been beaten down by life. And when they pray at night, they, they're praying for somebody to come along and notice. Praying for somebody to come along and, and choose them rather than them being left at the last. Nobody chose them, so you get thrown on whatever side as an odd person. Be the welcoming person. Show the anointing of God in kindness and caring and service, in an attitude of gentleness, with mercy and with self-control. Read that somewhere in here. It's in there, I promise you, I've read it. Some of you, yeah, I've read it too. We haven't read this yet, have we? Yeah, let me get to that. Thank you. <clears throat> hey, we are two in the Spirit. We are two in the Lord. And she's much more superior than me in the Lord. <laughs> I am also reminded of the historical saga about Gideon's 300. This small army was tasked with defending and fighting against a foreign force numbering many tens of thousands. Their expected outcome was death, although their duty required them to face this certain fate. With courage and superhuman vigor, these brave souls won the respect of their enemies. Their legend remains vital today. They still died. Every last one of them died. But, but the, the superior force did not mock them in their death. They did not mock them in their death. 
They respected them because people respect courage, especially when you've got the stones to not leave the field when the going gets tough or when the outcome is definitely not going to go in your favor. Stand to the last. We can afford to do that in Jesus because our reward is right on the next moment of our last breath. So much for death. Where is your sting? Where is your sting, death? I'm just breezing on by you. You can pay attention to somebody else. In fact, I used you to expedite my moment into the kingdom of God. So there. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray. And by our presence, we pledge that all unity is getting a good start. We'll be restored. And there know our Christians by our love. By our love. Not by our prowess, not because we do everything right all the time, not because we all come from privileged backgrounds, they will know us because Jesus Christ has favored us with his presence and by his spirit not just a part of him, all of him lives in each one of us. The the full thing, head to toe, in and out. Jesus lives in the life of the believer. For that reason, we lack nothing. For that reason, we have reserves to call upon way beyond we can even imagine because God hasn't put us in that particular trial yet. But I'll tell you what, when the trial comes, He's going to show up first and pave a way because that's what God does to those that he loves. He doesn't make you go out and take your lumps. If I'm taking lumps, it's because I got out ahead of him. We are to live in the way of peace and serenity and companionship one with another. And with that world. And for some of us, that world, that world was pretty rough. Thank God that he has given us a way through the cross to surrender our lives to something that is reliable beyond humanity, beyond beyond our comprehension, beyond our capacity, even beyond our wildest dreams, so is the Holy Spirit in Jesus Christ within us now, right now, full on, nothing held back. Hallelujah. Let me call on you to not only take this to mind, but to M-I-N-E, to mine the things of the Spirit within you. Call them up. Take good notes. Call to remembrance those things wherein God has shown himself faithful to you. And humbly ask him to give you some of the successes that you see in the lives of your other brothers and sisters. But I'm going to give you this guidance. You don't get their blessing without taking their risk. God loves you. He may not like some of the things about you. He intends to change those so that when you become, I would say, fully orbed, and for those of you who are fully orbed, you know what I'm saying, so that when we become fully orbed, when we become 
bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. You've heard me say that so many different times. It just, it works for me. Bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. A body that's imperishable. A soul that continues to learn into heaven. And a spirit that has such a capacity for peace that nothing can imperil it. Join me in devoting yourselves to the greater things. Join me in devoting yourself to become less so that Jesus can become greater. Join me in devoting yourselves to one another. Sit with somebody different on Sunday. And don't be in a hurry to get to your pew. Make sure the new people out in the narthex aren't left there wondering what to do. Be the one. Be the one that you're so glad somebody else was to you at one time. Came alongside, welcomed you. Came alongside, included you. Bought your lunch. You think they were just being kind? Come on, that was a strategy. They wanted another hour and a half with you to talk about Jesus. Hey, it worked in my life. They fed me enough meals, I got born again. (laughs) I actually thought I had them going. Little did I know that the Lord of the universe was working through them in a strategy that was way beyond what I thought I was. And I'm here to tell you that uh, the product that he's produced in my life is reliable. I could never say that before. But in these years, I can say that. I'm a reliable brother. I'm a reliable man. I'm a reliable friend. I'm a reliable husband. You know, the commercial talks about be like Mike. Hey, Mikey. Because they get Mikey to eat stuff nobody else wants to try. And at the end of the thing, it says, be like Mike. You know why? He got the first portion. He didn't have to wait in line and move the bigger kids out of the way. So who who won that? Did they or him? Mikey won. He walked away with a full belly and the rest of them had to divvy it up. So much for them. Be the first and not the last. Risk being genuine, even if you feel awkward. People are forgiving. You know, if you got somebody like me, you'll, you, I'd, I'd say to you, oh, I know you meant well. Be the initiator, not the responder, other than to God. Be the one that pads their day with time, that you are available and, so to speak, sitting by your phone waiting for a need to come in. Nothing more important to do, at least during that hour. Be that person. Make room in your soul for God to ask you to do things. This is not a boring situation we're in here. Just going from week to week. Seeing everybody on Wednesday and Sunday. Going to work, slugging through the day, going home. Going through work, slugging through the day, going home. What are you doing on your lunch hour? Sit with somebody new. Sit with somebody Maybe even you don't like. Because somebody sat by me 
and it changed my life. I needed somebody to sit by me in order for my life to change. I was too clueless. I was too barricaded by sin. I was running roughshod with Lucifer thinking he was the top dog because nobody introduced me to Jesus. And when you don't know Jesus, what you're looking for is who's in charge. Who's the top dog? Who's got the promises? Who's going to feed me the increase? Who's going to give me position? I'll tell you what, and I just say this to say it, hell doesn't like me these days. Good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. I get out of bed in the morning praying to Jesus, asking him to show me how to embarrass hell every day. Let me embarrass hell today, Jesus. And he said, well, that's fine, but you got to get out there. You got to run into it. You got to contend with things that are not to your liking and ugly and interruptive. And, but there is your ministry opportunity. Anyway, I don't want to go on and on and on. I just, I just trust that you are here in my heart and knowing that I am, in fact, one that the grace of God has been sufficient for me and his power has been made perfect in my weakness. And I'm going to live for him, even if it's making mistakes. Thank you, everybody. So, as David told you guys, you had kind of a rough morning. Um, he and I started a uh, program of detoxing from sugar, and we're following a book called The 40 Day Sugar Fast. And it is a daily devotional as you walk through this sugar fast. And one of the things the author warns about is because as you, as you give up sugar and focus on Christ, and, and she gives a, 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 a lot of good scriptures to, to reference and that kind of thing. But she, she warned in her book that as you fast and seek Christ, you may be attacked. Because that's the last thing Satan wants is for us to draw closer to Christ. And yes. he's going he's to throw things at us to try to deter us. Well, we started it a week ago, and since then we've had four days of no power, and we lost our dog this morning. It's a good sign. Hallelujah. Yes. And right after everything was done this morning and, and kind of quiet, I decided to make a Facebook post and put her picture up so that people we know would know what we've, what's happened. And, it's, and, and while I was putting that together, David says, we were both a mess. He says, I don't, I don't know if, we, if I can do the Bible study tonight. And I said, well, honey, you don't, you don't have to. I said, let Pastor know, get a hold of Russ, you know, whatever. And as soon as I posted my Facebook post, the one right underneath it, was a post from Ann Graham Lotz, who is Billy Graham's daughter. And I printed it off for you guys in the room, but I wanted to read it for, some, for, the, for the folks that, that are on Facebook and, and don't, may not know what I'm talking about. And David also referenced when he was talking earlier about that we're frail in our flesh. And this references that. Uh, it's titled, I'm Learning. And then it references uh, a scripture from 2 Corinthians 4, 7. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. 
It says, I'm learning that my faith is more important to God than my feelings are. I'm learning that his purpose is to develop my faith for an even greater goal of displaying his glory in and through my life. I'm learning to be at peace, content with whatever transpires, because I know whatever happens is in his hands. I'm learning to die to what I want and when I want it, and instead choose to trust God to accomplish what he wants. I'm learning to stay focused on him, fulfilling my obligations. And that answered about tonight. This is, it's not just an obligation, it's a joy to come here and be with you. And, but it's, uh, we focus on him and we follow through. I'm learning to love others and care for their needs when my own heart is broken. And it is. <clears throat> I'm learning to live with integrity in transparency excuse me, transparency before others, even when I can't see results. I'm learning to be faithful when my flesh wants to run away. That's that frail in our flesh. And as I'm learning, I'm also praying that God's glory peeps through the cracks in this clay pot. Uh, yeah. Thank you, honey. Yeah. Thank you. It's all yours. Okay. Thank, thank you, Lori. Thank you, Dave. God bless you. Thanks for having me. Thank all of you. Thanks for coming out. And uh, you know what? I think you did it again. Every. Every time I have a sermon planned for Sunday, then you start something else. <laughs> now I got to go home and start all over again. <laughs> Sorry. What a team. Same mind. <laughs> so we're going to give it a go. But yes, uh, Jesus. You know, that, that one statement, let me repeat that one thing yes. you said. Um, Dave said he was talking about heaven. He said, I don't want heaven to seem intimidating to me while I'm here on earth. I want to start now. Rejoicing and praising and, 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 and doing the things that, that I'm going to be doing forever. I, it can be intimidating. And <laughs> you might be uh, closer than we probably think. Most people just worried about not going to hell and not so much about going to heaven <laughs> so since that's the two choices they'll take heaven but if you ever see it there's a chance I may be preaching that Sunday is that alright please do it is it okay to preach on heaven in uh, lock and load man. In, the, <laughs> in this new day but uh, no, that some, just some really some remarkable um, thoughts to chew on and, and, and to take with you. And I, I really appreciate that because I, I know these are not just shallow surface kind of passing thoughts. These come from within. within. They come from the Spirit. Yes. And I think we ought to receive them that way. Receive it in the same Spirit in which it is given. <laughs> Amen. So I'd like to just say a little prayer as we close out the service and invite it, everyone to come on out Sunday morning. And uh, I promise you God's presence. And from there, he'll handle it. And very well, I might add. So yes. let's pray together. Yes. Our Father, we're so thankful today that you've heard our prayers, yes. as always. And you've ministered in the ways we've already asked. Thank you for Pastor Dave, for Lorianne, and for all of our wonderful people and who are present here today, which, which make the room and the mix in this room 
is the mix of the Spirit of God. And I'm sure that it extends into our viewing family on Facebook and on the internet. And may we really be changed, not just stirred, but changed by the words that we hear. And I ask that you would just sort of seal this all up within us, that we may not just be moved by it, but that it has moved into us. Yes. And may your spirit continue to be all that we know you to be. And thank you for this wonderful blessing here this evening. And, and we pray now and thank you in advance for the blessing that you have already planned for us the next time we gather together. In Jesus' name, yes. amen. amen. God bless you all. Thank you for coming. And uh, we'll see you all Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. And bye-bye for now.